kicking off this new series called DNA. The last four weeks, though, we've been in our last series called The Evidence. If you walk with the Lord, there should be some sort of evidence. And Pastor Tim Ross kicked off the series, so eloquently spoke about how in those days there was a, uh, just a, a, a lot of disruption in the rhythm and the cadence of that region. And he said, listen, let me speak to you in layman's terms. You're allowing all these other things to get in and muddy the waters. You're not staying sober-minded. Paul also talked about how there is a, a, a tug from our flesh that is weak, but our spirit is willing. So Paul began to articulate, listen, instead of being filled up with all this messy stuff, the things that are going to end in ruins, be instead filled with the Holy Spirit. And Pastor Tim talked about how it will change when you're filled up with the Spirit of God, how you walk, come on somebody, how you talk, and how you act. And then Pastor Brandon Barber brought an amazing word week too. Then I had the opportunity to preach, and my beautiful wife brought it last week. Can we give it up for Pastor Jackie? It was it was real, real good. You can go back to Hope City, uh, our YouTube channel, watch all of our archive messages. We have started this year off strong. Uh, I feel boldness specifically on this weekend as we kick off the DNA series. So I'm going to preach it like I feel it. Some things can be taught. Other things have to be caught. So your responsibility and our responsibility as humanity is to lean in and and listen and allow the Holy Spirit to touch our hearts or just dismiss it and walk out exactly the same way we came in. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm going to grow. Like, I refuse not to grow. Look at your second choice and say, my growth is non-negotiable. Like, I am, I am choosing to grow. Uh, if you've been a part of Hope City before, you know I say this statistic all the time because I want you to grab it. Uh, and if you're actually applying it, then you've probably written it down. Uh, but if you're a hearer only, you only retain 5%. That's it. It's not that much. Just, I heard a little bit, that was good, and then I left. If you take down notes, your retention rate goes to 35% in real time. If you take down notes and then go back and apply it, your retention rate goes to 90 to 95%. Come on, we're gonna keep moving forward. So elbow the person next to you and say, I'm gonna need a, an eyeliner or some, some piece of paper, an offering envelope, if we even have those, and we're gonna take down notes. Today's gonna be good. All right, DNA week one, here's our foundational verse. It is on the screen, Psalms 139, verse 14. I love this. I will give thanks and praise to you. Why? For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. Let's pray. God, give us ears to hear you today. We need a mind ready to understand. Most importantly, God, we need a heart prepared to soak up the deposit that you're about to place in our lives today. God, if we showed up as spectators to be entertained, Check a box off because we just showed up to church. And the truth is, God, this is no more than a karaoke moment, an entertainment moment. But if we came with expectation, we truly believe, because Matthew 18, verse 19 and 20 is true, where two or three gather in your name, you are in the midst of us. Your presence is walking up and down these aisles and across all of our other campuses and meeting us at home. So we are here today for you. If you receive it, say Amen. I love that line, you are fearfully and wonderfully made, not only biblically, but there's actually scientific evidence that backs this as well. Did you know that you have over 100 miles, 528,000 feet of blood vessels that run throughout your body? It's pretty impressive. Somebody like, that's pretty good, you can Google it. Okay, that you have over one trillion, with a T, one trillion bacteria moving around your body. Somebody are like, it's time for a cleanse. Like, it is that time of year. 100 trillion cells that make up your being. Look at your neighbor one more time. Say, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Look at your second choice. Just be careful with this and say, you're marvelous. You're marvelously complex. Come on, let them know. <laughs> so speaking of the way you're wired, the workmanship of the Lord, marvelously complex. Speaking of, my wife and I, uh, we're celebrating 19 years this July. Let's go. We've been best buddies for 23 years which is incredible. There's something embedded in her DNA that is unchangeable. Uh, I thought the first couple years it was just a trend. Uh, 19 years in, I realized it's embedded in her DNA. She claims it's because our oldest son, who's 14, this is part of his responsibility, and she's feeding that responsibility. But my wife has the ability to take a 12-inch deep by 10-inch round trash can and try to fit anything and everything in that trash can. Where's everybody? Come on, where's all the wives who do that? Come on, you're like, I'm doing it because I need you to take this trash out. You don't have to fit an entire love seat in the basket. Like, 
There's also a rule I grew up with that if it's a food item, you throw that joker in the trash can in the kitchen. It doesn't go in the schoolroom or the playroom trash can that goes overlooked for 30 to 90 days at a time. She says, well, if our 14-year-old son Brecken is watching that banana peel that has attracted a thousand different types of ants, would it be a problem? It's embedded in her DNA. Come on, everybody say, we're with you, Jackie. Come on, let them know. Say, we... She told me last night, she said, hey, shots fired. Just so you know, I will have the mic again. And then she started taking her earrings off and her heels. I'm like, what are we doing right now? And then she went and tried to jam a love seat. <laughs> okay, moving on. The thing. Definition of DNA, it's on the screens. The fundamental and distinctive characteristics or qualities of someone or something, especially when regarded as unchangeable. Y'all, there are certain things in life that are not changing. The world would like us to try to deconstruct it or even question it. It's not biblically true, and it's not even scientifically true. And God himself, which I'm grateful. How many of y'all are grateful for a God who's never changed, who has been consistent and faithful and constant? Watch this, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. The Amplified says, Jesus Christ is eternally changeless, always the same, yesterday, today, say it out loud, and forever. Malachi, if you're new to the Bible, Malachi, chapter 3. Verse 6 says, I am the Lord, and I do not change. I don't know. When I was reading this series of verses this week, it just, it just stirred up so much faith. Like, God, thank you. In a world that changes, in a climate of economics that change, in the ebb and flow of valley moments and mountaintop moments, I am grateful that you do not change. And so this weekend... I want to talk about something that is not changeable as well, as well in our DNA. I want to talk about and unpack how worship is a part of our DNA. Now, let me say that. Some of y'all are like, okay, I thought this would be something a little different. Because, you know, a lot of times the misconception is worship is for people that just led us up here, that have the ability to sing and musicians and people with mics and perfect harmonies and perfect pitch and all that stuff. And I want to just kind of pop that misconception, that bubble of misconception today. The Bible says in John chapter 4, verse 23, these are red letters. Jesus spoke these words. He said, a time is coming and now has come when the true worshipers, wave at me if you're a true worshiper, come on, across every campus, come on, will begin to worship the Lord. Here's the phrase, in spirit and in truth. It has nothing to do with your ability to clap on beat. That's just for the white people. Okay, I'm just saying, I'm just going to put that out there. It's like, I'm not, I'm like, All right, sorry about that. I know somebody's going to DM me over that has nothing to do with your ability to sing on key. That's really good news. That's, trust me, we're up here and we can hear you. Amen. <laughs> you know who loves your worship? Shaped and molded you, Genesis 127, in your image, or in his image. Genesis 127, shaped and molded you. This diverse, beautiful church that we get to be a part of. The one who loves your worship is God himself. The author of worship, the one who is the author and the finisher of our faith. And so we all, watch this, subconsciously, whether you know it or not, we all worship something or even someone. Again, whether we know it or not, it's the way we're wired, knit together. It's the way we were designed as humans. The depth of our being was intentionally made to worship. Watch this, let, let everything, Psalms 150, verse six. Let everything, that's all of us, let everything that has breath, everybody take a big deep breath. <sighs> Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. It says it again, praise the Lord. Come on, somebody give God praise. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath. And since God is the one who created and breathed life into us, we see it recorded all the way back in Genesis when he formed Adam out of the dirt and he breathed life into him, and he formed Eve and breathed life into her, we see that the very breath of God belongs to him anyways. And so just a moment ago, when we were worshiping and we were lifting our hands and we were singing across all of our campuses and even international, when we were worshiping, we are simply giving God his breath back, positioning our hearts. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15, that our worship is like an incense. It's like an offering that rises towards heaven God desires to receive our worship. And the other side is true as well. This whole good versus evil, we see it all throughout culture. As God wants to receive worship, 
Satan is attempting to hijack our worship. Why? Because he wants to be like God. The Bible says in Luke 10, 18, that I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. For those of you who may be new to the faith, Satan, also known as AKA Lucifer, was the chief musician and worship leader in heaven. Study it. This is Bible. And he exuded worship. He was the best of the best, but he wanted to be like God. God with a bunch of his, God took Lucifer and all of his little posse and kicked him out of heaven because he was trying to hijack the worship. We're all designed. We're all created to worship. In the fabric of you, there exists a worshiper. Look, look at the person next to you and say, I'm a worshiper. He's talking about me because he's talking about me today. So if you're taking down notes, week number one of DNA, the title of today's sermon is, There is a War for Your Worship. There is a war for your worship. There is a tug of war. Darkness versus light for your worship. Number one, write this down. Your worship, we talked about it, whether you know it or not, subconsciously we all worship something or someone, your worship is unavoidable. What does that mean, your worship is unavoidable? It means that as human beings, again, we were created to worship, so we're gonna redirect our worship somewhere. It should be vertical. It should be to the one who created you in his image, but the truth is we all worship something. It's unavoidable. A poet from long ago, the S-N-O-O-P-D-O-G, said, I've got my mind on my money and my... We're not gonna keep going. All y'all are like... <laughs> like, let it go. No, but the truth is, y'all think about it. Every song that you hear on the radio, every major hit that you hear is idolizing something. We can't avoid worship. Again, it's a part of our DNA. Everyone will worship something from money to cars, relationships, material items, status. Do whatever it takes to try to climb the ladder and to be seen. Ambition that becomes unhealthy. We all worship something or someone. Write this down if you're taking down notes. We can't run from it. But we can choose where we place it. You can't run from worship. You're going to worship something. It's going to be consuming you some way or another in your life. We can't run from it, but we can choose where we place it. Here's a couple examples. Maybe you have a tr struggle and you are worshiping status. It could be subconscious, but you're worshiping status, which the byproduct is it will cause you to treat people like a ladder to be climbed instead of a soul to be loved. Maybe you struggle with worshiping money. Maybe you're addicted to more. The byproduct of worshiping money is it causes greed in your life. You might even sacrifice your character at times to make an extra buck. There is always something. We see it all throughout the Bible. There is always something counterfeit to try to steal the seed and try to steal worship from God. What it is, we saw it all the way back in the garden when the devil deceived Eve with the apple we see an attempt of the enemy to try to pervert our perspective. That's okay. This is what you gotta do. You gotta hustle. And what ends up happening is we start looking at things and we gotta, we gotta redirect all of our attention and give God what's left. And we're focusing everything on status and on money and trying to get ahead. Here's the truth. I've said this for about two years. A lot of times we are living in a perpetual state of exhaustion. We are struggling I don't know about you, but statistically, we are struggling with rest. We're struggling. People are drinking multiple energy drinks a day. They're dealing with lots of caffeine overload. They're doing whatever it takes. Like, I'm sleeping, but I wake up. My mind's running. And I truly believe this, that a lot of times we're busy doing things that aren't our business. We're busy connected to things that are not a part of our assignment because maybe you're worshiping status. Maybe you've redirected and placed your worship worshiping money. It's an attempt of the enemy, again, to try to muddy the waters of your perspective. There is a constant conflict. The Bible says that the spirit realm is even more real than the natural realm, but because we're humans, we live in this. Like, this is what we see, feel, touch, taste. This is it. But there's a conflict in the spirit realm. There's a constant conflict in the natural realm for our worship. Not throughout the Bible, which I encourage you, go through the Bible meditate in the Word, stay in the Word, even if it's one page at a time. You don't have to speed read through the Bible. Get in the Word, and you'll start seeing all throughout the Bible. I was reading the other day how the Egyptians worshipped eight specific gods, the sun god, the god of war, 
uh, the God of fertility, all these different gods, but they had over 1,400 false gods they believed in and worshiped in their shrines and temples. Counterfeit options are available everywhere. There will always be something trying to steal your attention, trying to distract you from worshiping the one true and living God. How many of y'all have a word of the year? Like you have a word of the year. Some of y'all are like, uh, okay, nine of you. Okay, we're going to try to implement that. Somebody, somebody's like, my word of the year is Hot Pocket? I don't know, like <laughs> Ben and Jerry's? <laughs> so my word of the year is focused. Every day when I wake up, I put my feet on the ground. I literally say, today, I want to be my, more mindful of your agenda in my life. I want to have a there you are, not here am I mentality. Use my hands, God. Use my words today, God. I'm going to stay, say it out loud, focused. Because I'm realizing more than ever, distractions are dangerous. They can derail you, delay you, destroy you, deny you, and even defeat you. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm going to stay focused. Come on. You can have that word. You can take it. You can take focus. We're going to stay focused. This whole worship dynamic, if you're not focused, will distract and derail and pull you away from who you should be focused on. As believers, if you don't know Jesus, I'll give you an opportunity at the end of today's service. But as believers, we should be applying the most fundamental verse, I believe, in the Bible. Matthew 6, verse 33. You can just write the reference down. It's not going to be on the screens. This is just off the dome for a minute. It says, seek first. Another translation says, above all else. Another translation says, as your first priority, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things. Come on, that's the wisdom you need, the clarity you need, the peace you need, the hope you need, the fight you need, everything you need when you need it. Yet we reroute and place our worship and our attention somewhere else. So again, we can't run from worship, but we can choose where we place it. I hope y'all are catching this. Can you see, though, as we're unpacking this, that there is a war for your worship? So again, number one, your worship is unavoidable. You're going to worship something. It could be self. It could be a relationship. It could be status, money, all the things we've been talking about. Number two, write this down. Your worship is a pathway. Your worship's a pathway. Your worship is a pathway. Another way to put it is your worship is transactional. It comes with a price. It has a price. God's presence isn't a supermarket that we visit where we can just pick and choose what we want to worship for the day. No, his presence is a shelter that we live within. My friend William McDowell, prophetic pastor, brilliant songwriter, wrote the song, I give myself away. Like, amazing. He's out of Florida. He talked in a session that him and I were doing at a conference, and he said, the reward of worship, we, we have messed this up for years. The reward of worship is not blessings. That's a bonus because you're his kids. Like, the reward of worship isn't more things. Because the truth is, he already paid the price and has done more than enough. If the only thing Jesus did was hang on the cross, it would have been enough. But he's so good, he said, oh, but I will come and give you life and life more abundantly. The reward of worship is not stuff. If you showed up last night and you're like, well, let's go again tomorrow and put a little bit of money in because if I show up again, check that box, maybe I'll get my Escalade. Like, <laughs> now, the reward of worship, Psalm 16 talks about how when you're in his presence, there's a fullness of joy. The reward of worship is not stuff. It's not blessings. It's not even all your issues being fixed. The reward of worship, watch this, is him. The reward of worship is his presence. And it will always satisfy. It will always fill the voids where you've been self-medicating trying to climb the ladder. Trying to self-medicate with busyness. So I'm staying focused for some of us, though, we've made idols out of relationships. Maybe that area of your life seems and feels out of order. It starts to open the door to compromise. You let your guard down. Maybe it opened the door to lust or sexual issues. We've given so much of ourselves maybe to this relationship. And I wasted so much time and energy and attention that maybe when that relationship crumbled and fell apart, you fell apart as well. Maybe you put so much attention to that and that opened a pathway for you to offer yourself, but because you were sacrificing something that wasn't eternal, it left you empty and even feeling disappointed. And maybe you're sitting here today and you're like, Daniel, that's stepping on my toes. I'm still dealing with that. I've got great news for you. The presence of God can fix any broken area of your life. And when you redirect your worship to the one who can heal you, the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper, 
The one who his promises don't have expiration dates on them, who is faithful to complete the work he started in you. Yeah, you've made some tough choices along the way, but he will always be just one mention of his name away from being right there again as your very present help in time of need. Somebody should give God praise. Come on. Because through repentance, every one of those areas that have been out of order can come into order. So maybe you worship status. Maybe it's a pursuit. The truth is the byproduct of subconsciously or intentionally worshiping status has left you selling out. Maybe what you're doing, you're not passionate about anymore. It's only what makes you look accomplished into the eyes of those around you or your perfect and polished, controlled environment on social media. So yeah, you've got the house and you've got the car and you've got the material goods, but you're still unfulfilled. Again, there is a war happening for our worship. Why? Because the devil knows that your worship is valuable. He knows that if you would just realize as daughters and sons of the living God where your strength came from and that where your joy comes from and that John 15, 5, if you'll stay connected to the vine and we're the branches, if that's a choice, we remain in him and him in us, ooh, it says that we will bear much fruit. I don't know if you've ever been around someone. Maybe it happened today. You can tell when somebody is a worshiper or they're giving God praise because they've been through something. Like, I don't understand all her passion. Like, she's just singing super loud. Don't judge somebody's passion until you know their past. Because David said, I'll become even more undignified than this. Sometimes you'll sit around people that took off the garment of heaviness and burdens, and Isaiah 61.3 put on the garment of praise instead. So whenever I'm around people, I'm like, hey, you're going to make some, you're going to need to make some room. Because when we get to that, wait on the Lord, I'm about to jump around. Wait on the Lord, he will renew my strength. Because I know where I've been. I know I never should have made it. I know that every day is a gift. You can, you can give God praise. Come on. Our worship is valuable. The thing about this war for our worship, it's nothing new. I've said this multiple times throughout the years, but... There are, new, no, there are no new tricks or schemes or attempts of the enemy. There's no new demon factories. The same chaos we read about in the Bible, if you're a student of the Bible, is the same junk we deal with today. I'm in a Bible study right now, and we're reading through line by line Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 3. Paul is writing in prison, trying to encourage the church of Ephesus in a very desperate and broken place. And he's warning them and letting them know, like, hey, this is set in AD 60, AD 61. He's letting them know like, hey, the culture is messy. Self-worship is at an all-time high. Sexual immorality is at an all-time high. And he's naming one thing after another. And if you're reading it, you're like, whoa, that looks exactly like the culture we live in now. So when people ask Jackie and I, well, I can't believe you guys had four kids. Well, <laughs> you're brave. I can't even imagine having kids. I can't even imagine having kids in this culture. The culture looks exactly the same. It's more advanced now. Why? Because everybody and anybody can get on this. Back in the day, Paul's writing. He's writing from prison saying, hey, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. Make sure you're staying up, filled up with the Holy Spirit. It's easier now on social media. It's easier, easier now with this to spot a Jezebel spirit. It was harder back then, but we can, we can spot it and how a lot easier. The culture looks exactly the same. So the war for your worship is nothing new. I love this story. In the book of Daniel, some of you are like, oh, great. The book of Daniel, of course you'll preach out of Daniel. You have your own fast. No, listen, this is the book of Daniel. It has nothing to do with me. About three men who prioritized and through obedience positioned their worship in the right place. And because of their willingness and their obedience, God showed up for them and fought for them because of it. So we're a Bible-based foundation on the Word of God church. We're spirit-filled. We're life-giving. So it's not going to just be stories and fun moments and just blips of verses. We're going to read through right here, Daniel chapter 3, verse 10 through 30, 20 verses. I need y'all to buckle up. I love the reading of the Word. God's Word does not return to him void, and I believe the Holy Spirit is going to bring some revelation off of these pages. But what I love about this, y'all, the Bible is so entertaining. Like, if you are just bound by only watching Netflix, you need to open your Bible. If God hasn't spoken in a while, open your Bible. I'm telling you, it is good. It has hallmark love story moments. It's like lifetime sometimes. People trying to kill people. All kinds of violence. It's crazy. All right, let's go. Daniel chapter 3, verses 10 through 30. 
So this man is updating Nebuchadnezzar, who is off the rails. Nebuchadnezzar is building this statue in his own image, and he's demanding that the community and the region of Babylon to worship him. So this man is talking to Nebuchadnezzar and says, your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sounds of the horn, the flute, the zither, I don't, we don't even know what that is. I don't even know what the noise is. It's like, wow, wow, wow. I don't even know what a zither is. I asked our team, I said, Hope City Worship, like, can you guys find a zither? I think, they're, I think they found one. No, they didn't. Nobody knows what it is. <laughs> Nobody knows what that is. A layer, a harp, a pipe, and all kinds of other music. If you hear it, you must fall down and worship this image of gold. It's Nebuchadnezzar's self-image. It's this big statue. Verse 11, and whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into the blazing furnace. It seems reasonable. Verse 12, <laughs> but there's some Jews. There's some Jews whom you have set over affairs of the providence of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. By the way, if you're looking for good names to name kids, don't sleep on these names. <laughs> Get over here, Meshach. <laughs> like, I think these are good names. You put these three men over this region who pay no attention to you, your majesty. This guy's really gassing up, Nebuchadnezzar. They neither serve your gods, lowercase g, nor worship the image of gold in his own image that you've set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar. Sounds like a hardcore band, like furious with rage. Like, <laughs> furious with rage. Nebuchadnezzar summons Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these three men are brought before the king, verse 14, and Nebuchadnezzar says to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I have set up? So now he is going to try to manipulate and puppet master them a little bit. Verse 15, so when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the wow, wow, whatever it is, zither, the lair, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of other music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I have made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. This is where he starts mocking the big G God, the one true God. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? <laughs> Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, I love their honor. We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Verse 17, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God that we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. This is where great faith, Hebrews 11, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. So this great boldness rises up. And they said, but even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty. I, I, I bet they were just a little bit punchy about this. I can just sense it. We will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. I'm gonna pause here for a minute. Sometimes we read these stories and we're like, man, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, this is wild. You know what I hear? Our culture is getting soft. That's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing we get uncomfortable if the air is not right. We get uncomfortable if somebody took my seat. We get uncomfortable if we have to fight a little bit of traffic to get into a parking lot. Come on, somebody. We get uncomfortable with proclaiming. I, I just want to say this with boldness. If people around you are surprised that you walk with the Lord, it's time to grow. It's time for an awakening to happen in your life. If somebody walks into work and they're like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> what? Jeff goes to church. <laughs> Have you heard him swear in the break room? <laughs> Again, I'm not being legalistic, but a Christian means to be Christ-like to be set apart, to be above reproach, to no longer be caught up in the things that used to entice and pull you away. And anything or anyone who's pulling you away from the things of God is not from God. So as we grow, I just feel like we're getting soft. Americanized Christianity specifically. Now we have our friend, Pastor Morris here from Tanzania. Can you stand up? Can we make some noise from Hope City, Tanzania? And even hearing stories of the warfare that they deal with, pff, the softness of Americanized Christianity, we'd never make it. 
Because somebody's going to call us out on social media or make a pop shot. We're like, well, I probably shouldn't say anything. Oh, no, no. David said, I'll become even more undignified than this. I will have a voice and I will raise the standard. I keep telling our youth, I keep telling our kids, you don't have to be affected by peer pressure. You know, you know what you can be? You can be peer pressure. Your friends should be following your lead because of the answers of no, I don't do that. No, I won't say that. No, I won't act out in that. We have a friend, and this story came to me this last service, and it stirred in me, and I couldn't shake it. We have a friend who pastors an amazing church in Germany, and he was on the wrong side along with his son and his daughter and his wife when the wall was built. And one side of the wall had food and blessings, and it seemed like it was controlled in a in a good form, but the other side, man, they, they didn't have fruits and vegetables. They didn't have anything. It was persecution and chaos, and he said people would throw things over the wall, and he would run out, and he found an old bottle of orange juice that had expired. He said, I would put a little bit on my spoon every day and give it to my kids for vitamins, and him and his wife started a hidden underground secret church there because they knew if they were caught talking about Jesus and leading people to God, they would be persecuted, thrown in prison, or even killed. Y'all, this isn't that long ago. We read stories about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and you're like, thank God there's no fiery furnaces anymore. <laughs> like, our friend Ingoff is being persecuted daily, and at two in the morning, they knock on the front door of their house. They drag him out in the street in front of his wife and his two kids, and they said, we want you to right now tell us that you're shutting down this church you're no longer going to talk about this God you talk about, and you're going to denounce Jesus right now. And his wife is standing there with their little son and their daughter, and she's pleading, and she's yelling. And honestly, when I first started hearing Ingolf tell me the story, I thought maybe she was saying, babe, we'll do something else. We'll shut it down. Just tell them we can't lose you. Now it's the opposite. She said, we have not given up our entire lives. And God has not brought us this far just to have brought us this far. We will continue to preach the gospel. We will continue to tell people about Jesus. When I heard his story and he's telling us about it, my first thought was, what would I do? Because in Americanized Christianity, we've gotten a little soft. Somebody picks on us a little bit. We recluse pretty quick. It's just not worth it. Ingolf was hit in the back of the head with the butt of the gun and laid in the street for hours. They would not let his wife or kids touch him. He got up. She patched him up. Two days later on Sunday, in their little hidden underground church, he preached the good news again. And he said, even if I end up in prison or worse, I will not bend to these decrees. Now their church, after the wall has fallen, has, is thriving. They've romanced thousands of people to God. Come on, somebody. Obedience and faithfulness is not always fun, but it is always fruitful. So Nebuchadnezzar, furious. Where am I at? Am I like 19? Where am I at? Verse 19. Let's just go there. Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they said, hey, even if our God doesn't show up, we're still not going to bow. His attitude toward them changed. I mean, he's already a madman, but it's changed even more. He orders the furnace to be heated up seven times hotter than usual. This is crazy. And commanded some of the strongest soldiers in the army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them in the blazing furnace. So the men wearing their robes, their trousers, their turbans, and their Jordans were bound and thrown, that's the message translation, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. Verse 22, watch this though. Watch how the presence of God overshadows and is protecting these men the king's command was so urgent and the furnace was so hot. See, what you don't know is God was fighting for them even though they couldn't see it. And as Nebuchadnezzar was going off the rails, the flames were so hot that the very soldiers that he had ordered to come over there were killed when they threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. So all three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. But again, God was fighting for them. So verse 24, then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped up to his feet in amazement, he asked his advisors, weren't there three men tied up when we threw them in the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. That's <laughs> the way I read it. Verse 25, he said, look, I see four men walking around. 
unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like the Son of God. It's amazing that even a pagan king still noticed the real from the counterfeit. He said, ah, we threw three in, but four are in there. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. Look at how all this has changed. Come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. Satraps, the prefects, the governors, the royal advisors crowded around them. They saw fire had not harmed their bodies. It nor took anything off their head. Their hair wasn't singed. Their robes were not scorched. They didn't even smell the fire. Can you imagine they walked out like this? Like, still heat on the feet. Like, they weren't even, everything was, everything as if God put a hedge of protection around them. Then Nebuchadnezzar, watch, watch how all this unfolds. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel, rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command, and they were willing to give up their own lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is still not sanctified, so watch how this unfolds. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation, any language, who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're like, yeah. And he's like, shall be cut into pieces. <laughs> and their houses be turned into piles of rubble. But watch this. For no other god can save in this way. Verse 30, then the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Look at that. That proves that obedience and faithfulness isn't always the fun choice. But look at the fruit that was pr the, the fruit that overflowed because of this. So watch the three types of worship. If you're taking down notes, there's three types of worship we observe during this text. The worship of self, King Nebuchadnezzar, the worship of idols, that's the Babylonian people worshiping false gods, and the worship of a true and living God, that's where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were rescued. Verse 29, the nation was changed because of their obedience, and the fear of the true and living God was in the land. Verse 30, I said it a moment ago, but in the midst of all the chaos, God placed grace and favor on these men, and they were actually promoted not only in the eyes of man and Nebuchadnezzar, but also in the eyes of God. Again, because of their faithfulness and obedience to the one and true God. Come on, somebody give God praise. Come on, for the reading of his word. I love that story. So it's a choice. It's a choice again. We can't run from it, but we do have a choice for where we place our worship. So number one, your worship is unavoidable. Number two, your worship is a pathway. If you stay connected to the vine, you'll bear that kind of fruit. If you stay connected to self or money or a relationship, it's always going to end in toxicity. Number three, though, there is a war for your worship because your worship, your worship is a weapon. Your worship is a weapon. We see these three young men who chose to establish their worship in the living God, and a nation was completely transformed. Their worship became a weapon aimed at the hearts of the gods of self-worship and idol worship. And I believe that's even happening still today. Talked about this with... Ephesians, where Paul is writing from prison in AD 60 and 61, and it very much mimics and runs parallel the culture we run in now. We see a conflict of good and evil daily. Some of y'all are going to think this is a tad legalistic, but I'm going to say it. I feel boldness on this message. We see something like the Grammys. Jackie and I, we have some dear friends, Toby and Fat, who were nominated for New Artist of the Year. A beautiful thing. It's amazing. But we see on blatant display, they used to hide it. But the Grammys, which used to celebrate artistry and creativity, is now blatantly worshiping the devil and trying to tell the world and our kids that darkness is okay, that it's okay to play with this type of fire. And some of y'all are looking at me. I can see it on your faces. Come on, Pastor Daniel, you're being a little extreme. But now here's the reality. The carnality and darkness of this world is trying to make all of us, starting in our babies, to bend our moral compass to their degrees and to all of their dec uh, decrees. And the same tactics, the same schemes, the same tricks of the enemy that I've been talking about that are all throughout the Bible, the world is trying to sneak them in, starting with our kids. I looked at my three-year-old son the other day, and I said to Jackie, down on my watch, they're trying to infiltrate, and we are getting comfortable 
by subjecting our kids to this foolishness. And as we grow older and our callous hearts are starting to get comfortable dancing in both the darkness and the light. We're starting to comply to things. We're starting to allow the enemy to put a lid on our belief. We're starting to smother out our praise and our voice. We're trying to make fun and mock our influence. We're starting, to, we're starting to get comfortable around tables that Jesus would want to flip over. We're starting to allow things in and justifying it or becoming so callous to it or out of sight, out of mind or saying, well, I hope somebody else says something about it. If not us, then who? If the church of Jesus Christ can't rise up and say, we're gonna push back against darkness and allow the glorious light of Jesus to become brighter. If not us, then who? Jackie and I talked to a teacher in the lobby. She said, I wanted to resign this week. But she said, the boldness and the fire in you today, if not us, but who? She said, if not me, then who? She said, the chaos in the school that I'm in is so overwhelming. And I said, but you know, on most days, you're probably the only Jesus they'll ever see. So if not you, then who? <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says that we struggle. And we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the rulers of darkness. Powers and principalities are at war for your worship. I said it a moment ago, but they're trying to silence your belief. They're trying to choke out your boldness. They're trying to silence your passion for the things of God. They're trying to put a lid on your worship. They're trying to smother out your influence. I feel a mandate on my life. And I feel a mandate on our church. There's a righteous indignation rising up that's saying enough is enough. And so here's my proclamation and my decree today that not at this church, not at this city, we are called people of God to start pushing back. I'm no longer justifying the foolishness. We're no longer gonna be compliant with the silliness. Now we're gonna go to the word. My opinion doesn't matter. My opinion was to wear these off-whites in this flannel today. That's my opinion. Now we're going back to the Bible. We're going back to the Word. We're going back and recognizing that when we place our worship in the wrong places, the truth is it will lead to fruit and we'll live out fruit we were never supposed to live out. So your worship is unavoidable. Your worship's a pathway and your worship is a weapon. Will you stand to your feet? Would you lift your hands open-handed? God, I pray today that the power of your spirit, the light of your word will become brighter than all things dark. Things maybe that we've compromised in, areas we've become calloused in, areas we've become flipping in, areas, God, where we've just kind of just dismissed or overlooked. And God, right now, with your hands lifted, would you just release some things in your life that maybe has been smothering out good fruit in your life? Maybe you are here today and you say, Daniel, the truth is, man, this pricks something in my heart. I have been routing my worship in the wrong area. I have been worshiping status. I have been worshiping getting ahead and hustling and, and, and money. Listen, the favor of God on your life will get you in places and open up doors that hustling can't get you. When you worship the creator, the one who gives you the power to get wealth, the one who will open up doors of peace and courage and boldness and fight and perseverance, all things come into alignment when you place your worship in the right place. So God, I pray today that this word didn't fall on calluses or deaf ears or hearts, God, that has been hardened to what is happening around us, but instead, God, I pray that your light will illuminate. Our spiritual ears would be open. That's what I'm talking about, spiritual ears. That our spiritual ears would be enlightened and open today. And if there's anything in our lives that has been holding us captive, that's been holding us back, we release it right now. And we open up our spiritual ears. We open up our spiritual eyes. We look through the filter of your word. And we ask right now, God, that you would examine our hearts. Examine our hearts. Examine our hearts. Any area that we're not bold in, I pray, God, that you'd unlock boldness today. Any area that we've been silent in, I pray, God, that you would unlock a voice today. Any area, God, that we have felt depleted or weak in, I pray, God, that you would unlock great audacious faith 
Meet every marriage, every individual, every brother, every sister right where we're at, and we worship you. And we thank you for the authority that you have placed in us. Come on, Woodlands. Come on, Katie. Watching at home, West Houston. Let's just begin to worship for a couple moments. I'm telling you, I feel faith rising. I felt it last night. I have felt it all morning. So come on with authority. Let's decree. When I open up my mouth, miracles start. Direct our worship to Jesus and say, To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live, I live to worship you. Come on, begin to sing it out. To worship you, to worship you. Lifted, every hand raised to worship you, say to worship you. I live to worship you. I live, I live, I live to worship you. you. Come on, every voice and just the drums. Come on, say to worship you. choose to run from it we can attempt to avoid it but we all worship something or someone so our prayer today in week one of the DNA series 
is that we would choose to place our worship to the creator, the one who shaped and molded you, the author and the finisher of your faith. If you're here today looking at me real quick, if you would say, Daniel, here's the truth, man, this, this entire service, something in my heart has been convincing me of the fact, the entire service, that the way I've been living is just not working. And I feel a tug of surrender. We say this at Hope City, surrender is not a one-time event. It's a daily choice. But today, according to Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, it says that you can confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, and you will be saved. It doesn't matter how much money you have or don't have in your bank account. It doesn't matter where you've been and how blemished and messed up you feel you are. It doesn't matter if you're duct taped and super glued back together. His presence, the price Jesus paid, the tab that was paid in full, belongs to every single one of us. So that's the first invitation. You want to know the Lord for the first time as your Lord and Savior. Maybe the second invitation. You say, Daniel, this message pricked my heart because the truth is I have routed my worship to other things. I've gotten caught up and distracted. I'm living in a prodigal life. And today I want to come home and I want to rededicate my life to Jesus. I want to apply my worship life. My worship is a weapon. I want that to be unlocked again in me. And I want the light of Jesus to shine through me again and push back against the kingdom of darkness. That's the two invitations. We don't pray prayers for symbolic reasons. We're not going to just pray to pray it. But if one, you want to give your life to Jesus for the very first time. Two, you want to rededicate your life. When I hit three, either one of those two invitations fit your heart. On three, I want you to lift up your hand. Three, would you lift up your hand right now? I'm looking all over the room. I see you, 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 you. Just keep your hand up. I see you here and here. About 20 of you over there. I see you all the way in the back. I see you, my friend. I see you. Come on, Hope City. Can we give God praise for everyone who said, today's my day. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to rededicate my life. All right, so this is what we're going to do. You can put your hands down. Every one of our friends. Everybody around you, or maybe you're here and you didn't lift your hand. The truth is, God sees your heart. He didn't have to see your hand. But that bold step of those who did lift their hand, we're all going to pray. Hope City Worship, all of our creative team, even people out in our TV truck broadcasting it to Woodlands, Katy, Tanzania, and around the world, we're all going to pray with you. Say this out loud. Jesus, today, I'm committing to a life of surrender. I repent every sin, every struggle, all of my shame, I ask for your forgiveness. Thank you, Jesus, for hanging on that cross for my life. Even though I didn't deserve it, you did it because you said my life was worth it. From this moment on, I choose to live for you. You are my Father. You're my Savior. You are my Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, Hope City, across every campus, can we give God praise?